Welcome to Mitts Off, episode 11. Today we're doing something a little different. Uh, it's a little bit of a heavier conversation, but something I think that is very valuable and important in today's age and today's climate. Our guest is Slater Cuckoo, making his first podcast on screen appearance, uh, talking about some of the struggles and troubles that he went through during his playing career. It's heavier, but I think it's very important um, for a lot of people to hear. Mitsoff is powered by Sports Interaction, our exclusive betting partner. Get in the action, download the app with all new features to get started. 19 plus and please play responsibly. We have a very special guest today, uh, drove in all the way from Ottawa, former Tampa Bay Lightning, Chicago Blackhawk, Edmonton Oiler, uh, Mr. Slater's Cuckoo is in the building today. Slate, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. It's uh, refreshing to see a podcast uh, showing the honest side, um, diving a little bit deeper into hockey players, and I'm really looking forward to this chat. Well, I appreciate that, man, and I think it's important, right? Uh, I think it's important to kind of touch some of those ideas and, and struggles that I think we will get into here first, but... I kind of just want to ask you, you know, how, how you've been doing? You're back in Ottawa now, right? And are you, you're living there? You're just kind of settled there? Yeah, living in Ottawa. Uh, the wife and I love it. We're uh, settling into life outside of hockey. Uh, it's been a big change. Uh, anybody who's been through it, kind of taking some time away from the game knows that um, that schedule is tough. Like we're used to such a routine and getting up in the morning for certain things. So I've had to adjust in making my own routine and um, building my business, but I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later. And <laughs> um, But yeah, it's been good. It's been, uh, I've been living life and um, yeah, some struggles and, and some things that you have to go through, but Ultimately, I'm, uh, I'm happy to, um, yeah, just be living in Ottawa and, and living that life. I guess that's the place I'd like to start. And the biggest question is like the idea of not that you've kind of disappeared, but you've you know been a little silent since ending pro hockey. And I guess not a lot of people have have heard from you. It's it's kind of just wondering, you know, what what you've been up to in kind of post hockey life. And um, I guess generally like how you're doing as well mm -hmm. so yeah I, I left um it would have been 2022 um it was my birthday uh and i left from bakersfield california um i'll share a little story from from that um you know i had gotten sent down uh, from edmonton and um the first day i got there the coach was kind of like you know, how you doing? And I, told, I shared with him that I was having some struggles towards anxiety and um, just letting him know that my heart wasn't fully in it. Um, and he said, that's, that's fine, Slater. You come meet with me every morning, uh, Colin Chalk, before I forget, just a beautiful human being. Um, he was a the coach there and he said, yeah, every day come in, we'll have a check-in. And uh, I only have one rule is that uh, you don't walk away from the game uh, after a bad day. It has to be after a good day. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyways, I played a few games in Bakersfield, was still having these feelings of kind of what, I'm, what am I doing? Um, you know, I need some help towards my anxiety. I would like to talk to somebody. And um, it was my birthday and my wife was in town visiting. We went for a nice dinner. Um, and then thereafter I called the... Uh, Colin and said uh, it was my time to leave. Um, reached out to a therapist in Ottawa and and ended up enrolling in therapy. I want to know what kind of what state you were in when you got to Baco. Yeah, and it's just so interesting to hear of the a coach that sh allows players to show their human sides and actually like listens. Yeah. I think this is so refreshing. Um, can you go through? Can you go through yeah. that and the process of kind of getting sent down and, and where that led you to? Yeah. So I, I met Colin. I didn't, I didn't know of him. He was a new coach because Edmonton had just hired uh, Jay Woodcroft. And um, so Colin Chalk got, I'm not sure if he got elevated to the head coach or if they brought him in from the East Coast League, but he was fairly new in his position as well. So, um, you know, what an amazing human being to like he's trying to make a name for himself as a coach. And then this player comes in and, and wants to leave. 
and he had nothing but supportive words for me and like an open door to come and talk to him about whatever it was. I just saw that as such a human uh, side of the game that I hadn't experienced a lot of. Um, ended up playing the first game and then it came to the second game and I thought uh, what I was going to do that game was try on it being my last game for a little while. And so I got dressed for the game with the notions that it was going to be my last game, went through how I was feeling about it. And ultimately I didn't really feel anything. I didn't, I didn't feel like sadness. I didn't feel any sort of regret towards it being my last game. Um, I didn't really feel much at all. So, you know, with that in mind, it being my birthday the next day, we had a great day. That was, that was uh, when I called Colin and said that I was going to be taking some time away. The last game I ever ended up playing was at home in San Diego and they had two guys chasing me around the whole night and I had a minus and honestly Slade, I wanted to be anywhere but there. Hmm. I was on the bench and I I honestly wanted to to fake an injury. I wanted to say that like I was sick or something and just I just wanted to leave the game. I was like I want to be anywhere but here like I was having a legit panic attack. And I think that's one of the reasons I look back on the game with a bit of disdain is because I didn't, I wasn't afforded that opportunity to, I don't know, kind of, I'm not saying your experience is a good one, but I didn't really have that opportunity to like treat it as like, man, this might be the last time I ever might be on the ice. Like don't take this for granted kind of thing. So are you kind of able to maybe enlighten or share with us kind of, I know you mentioned the word anxiety, but kind of what you're dealing with or diagnosed with currently, or, you know, more of the exact struggles that, that you've been going through. Yeah, absolutely. I think that first off, I'll say that I think that men in general uh, have a hard time being uh, vulnerable with what they're struggling with. So Uh, since I released kind of my initial message towards what I was kind of struggling with, um, the feedback has been amazing on, um, just a lot of specifically men coming forward and saying that they've dealt with, uh, some of the eating issues that I have and, uh, you know, that me sharing my story has been a help for them. So, uh, you know, I would get nervous if it was, um, you know, a big (laughs) date or, uh, if it was a big game or whatever, I would get a nervous stomach. I held a lot of anxiety in my stomach, so I wouldn't be able to eat much, if anything. Um, That got progressively worse uh, through my time in Edmonton. Um, You know, I was, uh, this was a home opener game. You know, after I had just been uh, sat on the bench four periods in a row, (laughs) the, the following playoffs, we went to triple overtime and I didn't see a shift since the second period. Same D coach came back the next year. This was the first game of the season and I was just nervous as sin. I I was like, gosh, what am I going to do out there? I knew the coach didn't like me. Uh, So all I had that game day was a small piece of watermelon um, and ended up going to play the game. So I knew there was something wrong, but it was something that I I had dealt with my whole life, the eating thing. And um, I didn't think it was a huge deal. I managed fine. I got to the National League. everything was okay, but I knew there was going to come a time where I wanted my life to be more fulfilled and, and feel better. So that's kind of when I reached out and, and got connected with my therapist and for the rest of my life, this is, you know, anxiety is not going to go away. I know that I deal with it. Um, you know, big events, things like that, but, uh, I wanted better tools to do it. That's kind of what I've been working on and, and it's been feeling good. Well, thank you. First of all, honestly, I might have to thank you after every answer for sharing some of this stuff, because I think the word anxiety has a bit of a negative connotation. And I to share a bit about me, man, I I dealt with a lot of similar things, especially being a tough guy or enforcer fighter. I hate that word in the league and having the stress and nervousness from a game to game basis and wanting to perform and the internal pressures that I was putting on myself on a game to game basis got so much at times that I wasn't even able to focus on the game or play the game or Mm -hmm. even the practices, man, even the pressure of having to practice in the national league for me was being so scared of 
skating around, even stick handling or wanted messing up drills. Now that I look back on it, I'm laughing at myself because I'm like, why did I take it so so seriously? But when I you're that in that, too. when you're in that point, it's hard to get away from it. And you mentioned you said, yeah, I got to the National League, mm-hmm. but can you remember a time that that started, or you really started to see it being de- debilitating and affecting? you're on ice or when it started to come to the rink with you? Mm. I think it was, you know, from an early age, uh, obviously the pressures are lower through minor hockey or even major junior. Um, so, you know, I built it with my uncle in, um, Peterborough, my aunt and uncle, Tony and Mary Lynn. And, um, my uncle would notice sometimes I'd just go through phases of not eating as much or, um, so, I mean, it was present there, but, it would come and go, uh, where it became a challenge for me was, um, I think I shared with you a little bit, but, um, when I started to want to be out of the lineup, uh, I started to want to be healthy scratched in order for, you know, I could avoid the pressures. I could have a good eating day. Um, I didn't have to deal with being yelled at or, um, you know, being judged, And I think that a ton of people in life struggle with that problem. Like how many people, um, you know, just in their, in their day to day work or in school know the answer to a question and they refuse to put their hand up in fear of, um, you know, talking in front of the group or, you know, being embarrassed for their answer being wrong. That's what I was doing in my everyday life. I was scared to go out on the ice and scared to make those mistakes and, I wanted to be comfortable. I wanted to be out of the lineup, but then that scared me in the sense of, uh, one of my biggest fears is wasting my time, uh, here on earth. And it's such a short time that I knew I needed to go get that help and, um, create tools in order to be better, uh, for after hockey. Uh, so I want to go back just a little bit, peel back the layers. I think you took a, not a very prototypical route as an Ontario kid. Um, to go out West Mm -hmm. and you played at the famous, I guess you would say it's a hockey factory for, for some pro hockey players in, in Notre Dame. Um, could you tell us a bit about that and you know, your decision to go out there and move away from home at a young age? Yeah, for sure. Notre Dame was, um, just an amazing time in my life. I look back on those two years and, um, just have amazing memories and met, a ton of, uh, great friends that I'm still in contact with today. Uh, Morgan Riley from Toronto here on the Leafs, uh, was my bunk mate for two years. Funny cat and, uh, good dude. Yeah. Great dude. Um, just a real great human being. And, uh, we still communicate today and, um, yeah, it was just an amazing place because everybody's there pursuing, um, you know, whether it's an athletic goal, uh, education goal, uh, a lot of driven, uh, students and the teachers were amazing. Still have, uh, still in contact with a lot of the teachers. And it's funny, my parents dropped me off at, uh, this, you know, town of gosh, I I'm going to say 50. I hope they don't get offended, but (laughs) it must not be more than that. And, uh, you know, I think both of my parents were crying. They're like, Oh my gosh, we're leaving our kid out here. How old were you? I was, uh, 13 or 14 grade grade nine. So maybe 14, but, um, yeah, just in the middle of nowhere, 40 minutes South of Regina. Uh, but just amazing memories, beautiful people. And, uh, the hockey was great. So no, no complaints at Notre Dame. I think I want to get into pro hockey. Cause for me, my first year pro man was one of the funnest years of my life. It was me running on a lot of adrenaline. I was fighting everyone in the league. It was the first time, I mean, move away from home in junior, but like it was the first time being on your own. And like I got my first apartment lease and like had a roommate, one of the boys on the teams and we had this veteran team and we were winning. It was just like so fun for me. I didn't mind that I hadn't gotten called up to the national league. Uh, But then like year two and year three start to happen and it really starts to hit. Then you want that taste of, you know, maybe getting up to the NHL or whatever it is. I found that's when I started running into my struggles. Mm. Um, Did you find that the up and down was that, did that affect you a lot? Was that, you know, a, a, 
a tough time for you splitting duties mm. between the queues and down down to Tampa? It was, I would say it had its challenges. I think, like you said, in those first, um, you know, my first year in Syracuse, I only got called up for a three-game stint uh, with Tampa. And, you know, your first NHL game, it's like, you know, it's all happy smiles all around. I knew it was a for a finite amount of time because – I think it was Jason Garrison was going to come back from a short in- injury with Tampa. So, I mean, I got my first NHL game in Toronto. My second game was in Ottawa, so my hometown. And it was just like a whirlwind experience. And I also had a hunger after that first year. I knew I was going to go back to Syracuse. That was fine. Um, it was near the end of the season. So I had that hunger the next season to try and get back to the National League. But um, like you said, the American League... I truly um, think that every player should have time in the American League. It is such an amazing bonding experience with your teammates. Um, You know, to be candid, there's not those guys making huge money in the American League. There wasn't when I was playing in Syracuse. So, you know, everybody's on an equal playing field money-wise where we're all looking out for each other and everybody's – hanging out with one another and the parties are all inclusive and um it was just a really fun time funny story from the american league i'll just share it quickly but we were in um adirondack my first year when i was with syracuse and we were playing adirondack my first year had brian mcgratton um riley cote cote who was the other tough guy um gallant oh yeah they had they were nails and um we go into adirondack we're like we're scared shitless to get hit or you know to get jumped whatever don't they end up putting 10 goals on us brian mcgratton had a hat trick (laughs) 10 spot (laughs) yeah and the coach came into the room i think it was in between the second or third period and um you know the coach singled me out hilarious he looked at me and he says he says, uh, I was acting like Brian McGratton was Marion Hosa out there. <laughs> and I just started, my roommate, Blue, Dylan Blue, just who lived with me in Syracuse, like hits me on the shoulder while he's screaming at me. And I was just like, ah, you know, next practice, no pucks, but just a funny, amazing experience to be in the uh, AHL to start. I feel that though, man, like every team, and I tell this and people don't believe me, like every team had like three legit heavies yeah. and it was like a nightmare every night. I remember my first night going into Syracuse, they had John Morasti. Let's just take a moment to appreciate the war memorial in Syracuse. Too. It is what a barn. barn. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I walked in there for my first time and I was like, wow, this is like, this is slap shot. Like this totally. is like the visiting room is right underneath the stands. And it was just crazy. I ended up fighting John Morasti my first game ever playing there. He beat the wheels off me. Pretty, I don't know, beat the wheels, but he shined me up pretty yeah. good. It was his only shift of the game. Um, so that was good for him, I guess. Um, <laughs> that's funny though, man. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Great stories from the American League. Oh, it's just the best. It's just some of my best memories are like that because it's like a family, man. Totally. And like, there's way less ego, right? Way when less. the salaries are all d- rolled back like that, there's just way less ego and everyone kind of has this common goal. And in the American League, like if your team's doing well and winning, it's good for everybody. Absolutely. Not just for you getting called up to your team, but for your exposure around the league. So yeah, I'm glad we gave the American League a little shout out. Mm-hmm. You said something a couple answers ago that was so fascinating for me to hear. And when you're in Tampa and you started to get out of the lineup, you said you started to enjoy that feeling of not playing. That to me is, wow, it, that's powerful, A, because I think the goal is once you get out, you're always like, man, I can't be scratched. Like I got to get back in. Like the longer I was out, like in Jersey, I sat out for like 20 games in a row, dude. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm waiting to walk in and Ray Shero tell me I'm getting waived Absolutely. or I'm getting traded yeah. or whatever's happening. But you said you started to enjoy that feeling. You got to expand on that for me. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it was like, um, you know, me dealing with a few different things. It was not wanting to confront the anxiety towards my game days. Um, you know, not wanting to make mistakes out on the ice in order to, you know, get called out by my coaches or by um, teammates or whatever it is. It was, you know... I, I'll probably put it as a scaredness towards um, 
and that t- ties into anxiety for sure. Um, it was a more comfortable life for me to, you know, be part of the team, you know, being on the roster, still collecting pension credits and, uh, but just not playing the game, not like being out there to make those mistakes. And that was a scary realization. I knew it was not a sustainable way to live by being a healthy scratch, because ultimately you have to play to stay up in the NHL and to stay, uh, on a roster. But, um, it was safe for me. It was a comfortable spot. Uh, I didn't like it. Ultimately, it's what led to me um, reaching out and, and getting the help towards my anxiety that I needed. Um, but yeah, it was it was a comfort zone thing for sure. I, I feel that so much. I just remember so many specific occasions. One was Chicago when they were stacked. And I just remember being on the bubble on the outside and being like, do I really want to play tonight? Right. Do I really want to go out yeah. in the United Center and get caught out against Kane and Taves and get absolutely skated around? Right. And that feeling would kind of pass for me after the game. I'd be like, damn, why did I think like that? I kind of wish I played tonight. Yeah. Or like we get up to nothing and you're sitting in the stands. You're like, man, I wish I was out there with the fellas. Mm-hmm. But I so, so am on you with that where you just did you, it was just less pressure, right? Because totally. you can't, you're not going to make a mistake. All you had to do is get to get a bag skate out of the way. Right. Right. And it was, my day was done by 11 AM. So I had the rest of my day with a calm mind, a uh, calm stomach to eat, to recover. Um, yeah, without that pressure. But I think an interesting point that I kind of went through was that, um, you know, that anxiety tied into after the game where, uh, if my team had won or if they lost, it was a different feeling towards the next game. The anxiety played into um, if our team had lost, I had a want to be back in the lineup after that because I felt I could make a difference. Um, it was something that I was going to bring to the table uh, to help the team. But after a win, that's when I'd um, really say to myself, I hope I don't get in next game because the pressure would be way too much. It would be, if I go in and we lose now, then it's all my fault. It would, um, it would really weigh on me. So yeah, it was, you know, looking back, obviously there were times where the scratching hurt more than others. Like my last year in Edmonton, we were in Ottawa for the first time since, uh, COVID. And this was three years, um, after, or two years after the pandemic had started the first time they were allowing fans back into the, into the rink and, um, Edmonton scratched me in, in my hometown when I could have had family there for my last time in Ottawa. So that was a tough one, uh, to this day. And, um, but yeah, when you're on the road or something, a scratch didn't really mean a lot besides letting your family down and watching on TV. So in no way trying to one up you and in no way, shape or form, but my last time in Toronto with the Oilers, Todd McClellan, we only had 12 forwards Yeah, and he made the decision to scratch me in Toronto and call up a kid from the minors to play over wow. top of me. And it's just like, at that point you're like, dude, are you, are you serious? Well, like, where's the human side? Like I'm only going to play six to eight minutes. Am, am I, I really that much that, of yeah. a liability? Am I going to be that much of a, a hurt to the team? I was like, that was devastating. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's really no empathy in, in that sense. And I know it's things a business. Really... People will be like, Oh, it's a business. And you know, they got to put the best team on the ice possible, but it's like, I'm on the roster here. You're keeping me on the roster. Play me five or six minutes in my hometown, five to 10 minutes. I'm not taking away that much ice from the big guys. Just <laughs> throw me a little bit here. I think it does a lot for your locker room too. Like your teammates, that's what creates culture. Your teammates would see that like, hey, that's a good move by a coach. Ma- right. Making sure that Slater plays today. I know it means a lot to him, you know? Well, it, totally. And a veteran might understand a young guy coming in and in their hometown if it's not yours. And so I just think that a lot of the human side was neglected, um, a few places that I played and, uh, it was unfortunate. Well, I know you talked about one with Rick bonus in Tampa. Was that, mm-hmm. that was a similar one. You only played a couple, a couple shifts that night. You had some family in town. Yeah, that was tough. My parents were in town. Um, one of their first visits to Tampa to watch me play and, 
yeah, bonus only played me one shift per period. Uh, I was, you know, two minutes and 30 seconds of ice mm. time. And my parents, my parents had a flight the next day out of Tampa. And I remember just crying. I was like, gosh, like, I'm sorry, guys, for letting you down. Like, you could barely even see me out there. And I felt like a letdown to to my family. And uh, my parents left that next day. And then the following day, we had a game uh, against Pittsburgh. And uh, somehow I got in the lineup after only playing two, two minutes and 30 seconds. And I ended up scoring my first two NHL goals the next oh. night. So... It felt good. I wish my parents would have been there, but um, yeah, it all worked out, I guess. Ends up being a great story, yeah. man. Good for you. I think that's such a, I don't even want to use the word toxic, but way to look at your own self is like you feel like you've let them down. Yeah. That just hit me hard, that mm -hmm. line where it's like, I'm sorry. God. I said the same thing to my parents. I was like, I'm so embarrassed, you mm -hmm. know, like I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I feel like I wasn't playing good enough and now we're in my home city and I'm not even good enough to play in. It's like you always reverted it, had this habit of reverting it back on yourself. Totally. And you seem like you did project that on yourself a little bit. Of course. And it was a huge thing, Luke, on like, um, I felt that I didn't invite a lot of my family to the cities I was playing in based on, I didn't want to let them down because I, you know, you and I were in a similar position of, you know, not being in the lineup every night. And I didn't want to have that burden of them, you know, spending their hard earned money to come to my city. And then I didn't even play the game. It was like, it was a really big balancing act of wanting to see them and not wanting to let them down in person because, you know, a phone call is one thing that, it's upsetting when you're, you're scratched on TV or whatever it is. But when they come to the city, I know, you know, their, their line was always that it doesn't matter if I play, it was uh, getting to spend that personal time together. So I appreciated that. And, and we did get to spend a lot of memories together, but definitely weighed on you as a, as a human. And that, uh, that impacted you mentally a lot. Hey, definitely on yeah. a day on like a day to day scale. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And it was always that, that weight we were just talking about, wanting i got to a place where i was wanting to be out of the lineup but i didn't want to let my family down so that was a a balancing act of like gosh i want to play this game to make my family proud but you know i don't want to get yelled at by the coaches and like not be able to eat today so it was this constant war going on in my mind of what was the right thing and ultimately i chose myself and and to get that help that i that i needed how did you deal with it socially on the team? I know that hockey is a very masculine, old school style culture, hang out with your teammates a lot on the road, right? Mm -hmm. And I know there's certain times where you're going through a lot of shit, right? And sometimes you just kind of want to be by yourself. And I found that I wanted to do that a lot. But when you do that in a group, you're seen as a bit of an outcast and a bit of a weirdo, right? Totally. Yeah. When you, I didn't like, it's such a, a small example, but even like playing cards on the plane with the boys after, like there were some nights where I just wanted to go sit in the back, put my headphones on, freaking cry some nights and <laughs> yeah. just be like, man, I just want to be by myself. But everyone's like, what the fuck's up with guys, you know, yeah. or you're on the road and they're like, and you're like, I'm just going to order room service and hang out tonight. Why are you being such a weirdo? You know? Right. Uh, so, with that being said, like, how did you juggle all that socially and with the environment of your teammates around dealing with what you were dealing with? Yeah, it was an interesting one for sure. It was like, um, like you said, when you get into a new city and, you know, the guys kind of go through the plane, um, you know, asking what you're doing for dinner or if you want to join them. And I kind of had uh, a few things going on where, you know, I, I wasn't great in a big group eating wise. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to be in the lineup the next night. So that anxiety kind of wore on me. And the other part is that I liked being by myself a lot. Um, I liked exploring, uh, the road cities we were in. Um, I'm also Dutch, so that comes with a little bit of cheapness where <laughs> <A little> frugalness. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mind like the boys would be like, uh, you know, sometimes they'd say, uh, Kooks, do you want to come out for dinner? And I'd be like, 
no, I'm good. And they'd be like, what do you have on, uh, what do you have on tonight? And I'd just say like, don't worry about it. Like I had like these big plans, but when really I was, you know, walking the city, um, having a little bit of me time and, you know, probably going to Chipotle or, uh, yeah. something cheap. So I could just eat it in my room and, uh, get that relaxation time. Um, I mean, uh... I'm assuming that there's guys that you leaned on along the way. So in saying that, I just kind of generalized the team as a whole. There's guys like that on teams that aren't like that, mm -hmm. right? That are cool. And you have that relationship with that don't really give a shit about all totally. that other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to Chicago, had some success. And I know you mentioned Jonathan Taves. Mm -hmm. So was that a guy for you? Can you talk about your relationship with him and getting to Chicago and kind of dealing with some of that stuff that you brought with you to, from Tampa to Chicago? Yeah, I think that when I got to Chicago, I was, you know, I had played, um, you know, roughly, I don't know, but probably around 50 games in my NHL career uh, while I was in Tampa those years. And uh, I got traded to Chicago, didn't know what to expect, really had um, no name to myself when I got there. And just the warmth and you know, the human side of, of Jonathan Taze and what he did for me was, uh, so amazing. I think it was a really big, uh, attribute to me having that success in Chicago that I did, you know, as minuscule as it was, it was, it was just amazing to come in and have that feeling of, I always refer it to, you know, I was making close to league minimum when I got to Chicago. And if you would ask me, Taser felt made me feel like I was making 10 million a year. He was, you know, encouraging me to come out for dinner, but in a, in a nice way and, and just really made me feel part of the team. Uh, him and Dunk, uh, obviously Patty was still there and uh, Siebes was great. So those veteran guys, it makes such a difference, definitely in the dressing room and, and making those smaller guys feel like a part of the team can have such an impact on, uh, on their lives. Damn, that's cool, man. It's always nice when someone takes some time out and even, you know, makes makes it feel like a welcoming totally. environment. How were you getting through this? Because I know we had we had weigh-ins day in and day out, yeah. right? So I can imagine you might have been, were you flirting with the numbers a little bit? Um, I was flirting hard. If I could avoid the scale um, when we had weigh-ins, I would and just tell the trainer. Yeah. Like... Luckily, I'd built a relationship where I don't know if he just trusted what I said to him, but I would just say what my weight was, even though it wasn't even close. Or I would be getting to the rink, you know, 30, 40 minutes early from for practice and have like six or seven bottles of water to try and get up. You know, I came to calculate that a bottle of water was about a pound. So if I could get five or six, there's five or six pounds uh, back on me. So uh, always trying to calculate the weight and, um, yeah, it was, it was quite the struggle. I want to, uh, talk about COVID pandemic a little bit. I hate, hate talking about it. It's, I don't know. It's just such a dark time. I mm -hmm. feel like for so many people, it forced me into retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in San Diego feeling very worthless about myself. I had a coach there that, did not instill a lot of confidence in me, to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't feel very much value. Played six out of 56 games or whatever it was. COVID hits. Boys all get sent home. Um, AHL gets canceled. And I took that as a sign. And I felt like it was just moving the goalposts, right? It was started as two weeks and it was a month. Mm -hmm. And then we had a shutdown and all this shit happened. But that's where I really started dealing with a lot of shit, man. Mm -hmm. I started getting into some really bad habits and started getting really warped up top and, you know, dealing with anxiety and depression and shit like that. Was that a similar experience for you throughout pandemic? Did that intensify or magnify some of the issues that you had going on already? Mm. Well, thanks for sharing your story, a little bit of it. Um, you know, I look back at the pandemic as a, as an interesting time because I met my wife during the pandemic. So it was like this, um, this time when the world was needing human connection. And 
Um, you know, my career was, Edmonton was floundering. Like I was like in and out of the lineup still. I wasn't having the success that I had with Chicago. So, but then there was the part that um, Santana couldn't be in Edmonton as often as we would have liked based on, you know, her having a full-time job in Ottawa and trying to visit, but the, um, you know, they had to be COVID tested to be able to come to Edmonton. And anyways, it was, it was a lot to deal with. Um, I think the biggest thing was just being able to have that human connection. I didn't, not being able to go and meet people in my community, which, was a big thing for me when I was in Tampa and Chicago. I became friends with a lot of, um, you know, restaurant owners in the city or, um, you know, people just working in and around the arena. I became really close with them. And during that time, I I wasn't able to see a lot of those people. And it did wear a little bit on me, but I think the fact that I was able to meet my lifelong partner during that time gave me a one up, uh, advantage because we got to know each other really well quickly. And she, she has been just an amazing support system for me. How do you look back on the game? Like how, how do you view hockey or like how, how, how how do you see your relationship with hockey now that it's, yeah. Now now that you ended that way. (laughs) Well, it's interesting. It's been an ongoing battle that I've had with it because and my therapist, Claude, has just helped me in so many ways. Um, I looked back with a lot of um, letdown, a lot of, um, you know, I was a 10th overall pick. And, you know, one day Claude came into our session and she she read off my stat line. And I thought it was so fascinating. Like a therapist comes in and reads your stat line off and, you know, I don't have great stats. Same, buddy. Don't worry. <laughs> but they, they weren't like they weren't terrible, and I was like, "Gosh, a kid from Winchester, um, you know, my father never played, never had the opportunity to play hockey. He was farming and milking cows, growing up, and my mother was a figure skater and taught me how to skate. But this kid from Winchester, Ontario, grows up and makes it to the national league at all. Like, what a blessing and what a what an accomplishment in life. I think that." through a lot of therapy and a lot of help from my wife and family, it's been accepting that I did it and you know, you did it too and how we can bring that forward in a positive light. And you know, it's funny, my wife and I were just on a trip down to um, South Africa for a safari and you know, when we're in Toronto or when we're in Ottawa or Montreal and you say that you play in the NHL, it's like, the fans know if you did or not. Right. But when you're in 90% of this 99% of this world and you say to somebody, I played in the NHL, all that's taken from that is, wow, like that's an amazing accomplishment. So why not start living our life? And if everywhere we go with that same sense of accomplishment, instead of feeling this guilt or this, you know, lackluster feeling for what your career became, just the accomplishment of doing it is just a beautiful thing to bring forward. It's amazing words. Give yourself a little credit, man. Do you still love the game? I love watching the game. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find yourself still taking in games, watch all, whether it's in person, are you still watching it and engaged in it? Definitely. I'm, I grew up a Leafs fan and, uh, you know, now we live in Ottawa. We got exciting times with the senators, new ownership and, um, but I still gravitate towards watching the Leafs and hoping for the best for them. (laughs) And, uh, but I love watching the game. I love analyzing it. I love, um, you know, talking to friends about it now. I've gotten to that place where, yeah, I love, I love the game. I didn't love what it, in some ways, how it treated me and, uh, you know, the injuries and things like that. But, um, I'll go forward in a positive light towards hockey. So what would you change? Like, is there something you change and look back? And I know it's a tough question, but I, we touched on it before. For me, it would be to not take myself so seriously mm-hmm. and not put so much pressure on myself. Yeah. You know, um, do you feel that way at all? Or would you change anything about the way that you went into the game or the way you thought about it? I think I have two avenues towards that. It's like some days I look at it and I wish I didn't, um, treat the coach as if they were God. 
I wish I, you know, made more light of it. Like you said, yeah. take it less seriously. Like yeah. I was so scared to be yelled at and uh, so scared to make a mistake. And I'd be up all night after a, a turnover because I knew it was going to be on video the next day. And it's like, who cares? You know, like <laughs> know. these guys, I just envy the people who can get through a video meeting like that and just let it go off their back. I think it's um, a true skill that a lot of the greats have is taking it in, making it better, but not dwelling on it. Um, but on the other hand of that, and the second point to, to my answer is I have come to a point where I feel grateful that I was in the position that I was in because um, I could handle it and I got through it in this way. You know, if there was somebody that was a seventh D or um, that got scratched as much as I did, who potentially could have um, went to something unhealthy and a coping mechanism or uh, went to a dark place based on not playing. I'm happy that I, that I can accept it, that I got through it and that I was the person chosen to be in that spot because, you know, I think God knew that I could handle it. Tough times make tough people. Yeah. Um, you're so well-spoken. I'd love to hear, what your message would be to players or just people in general that were going through or are going through similar things that you did. Yeah. Well, it's funny because um, some of my younger cousins are like playing minor hockey and they, ha they have asked me like, what's your, what's your advice? Um, I think if, if you're going through a tough time, like I said, you know, coaches aren't going to like to hear this, but downgrade the coach's opinion like they are one person in this world that you know they have an opinion sure they might be called an expert but you know for a reason you got where you are keep those skills uh in your heart and at the forefront some people you're not going to be everybody's cup of tea here but you're somebody's right like just keep those skills never dim your light for them and uh bring that forward. And then another thing that I give my cousins is I always sat a small little, um, um, advice, but I always knelt whenever the coach was doing the drills on the board, I always sat at the front. Like I always knelt right. I was always front, front right. Board. Yeah. Front right, buddy. You're just speaking and the, to the coach, choir. sometimes the coach would get eye contact. It didn't really work with, for me. I didn't get a ton of ice time, but the coach sees that. And it's a small thing that can like, give you a little bit of uh, good grace in the coach's mind. So that's what I give my cousins as advice. Yeah. <laughs> I got one with the bench thing. I used to sit at the end of the bench yeah. and I had an older guy tell me towards the end of my career, even if you're not playing, move down with totally. the boys, get in front of the coach. You have to don't be fucking there. sulk on the other side, yeah. you know, like, um, and don't dim your light. I love yeah. that. That's fantastic. Whoever's listening, don't dim your light for others. Um, are you done with hockey? It's not, uh, it's not written in stone now. Uh, I still keep in shape. I don't know if you can tell, but, uh, Look good, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> the wife and I are in, uh, boot stamp, uh, boot camp style classes. So yeah, we're, uh, she's got me working hard and I don't know if, if I, if there comes a time where I miss the game, I'm only 29 now. Um, as of right now, no real plans to go back. But if, if I wake up one day and really miss it and, you know, get back to training and think I'm in a good spot, then who knows? I'd love to catch up with you and ask you about, you know, you're kind of a business entrepreneur now. I was scared shitless, I think, kind of talking about that retirement and COVID stuff when all I really knew was hockey mm -hmm. or all I thought I knew was hockey. Right. And it's ironic that I'm working in hockey still, but I did realize that hockey players have so many other critical life values and skills that you learn in the game that mm -hmm. you can take over to other industries. It doesn't have to just be all about hockey. I'd love you to tell me a bit about your business venture uh, and, and what you have going on these days. Yeah. Thanks. Um, fulfill work is my company F F Y L work. And, um, it stands for fulfill your life and where it comes from was the, um, satisfaction that I felt from talking to those people when I got to the arena who were working in the arena and, you know, 
these are valued human beings. They're doing a job for the, for the organization. I wanted to make them feel valued. So what fulfill work is, is single shift work for businesses to hire from. And what I do is place people in positions just for the day, single shifts, um, in whatever fits their life. So, you know, it's putting the life aspect back on their life. They can work when it fits for their life and, um, fulfill pays the workers same day, which makes it super attractive. Um, and yeah, it's been going well. I've been meeting a ton of great people, uh, building up the worker roster base, the workplaces roster and, um, seeing where it takes me. But it brings me back to making everybody feel valued in the room, um, no matter what your position is and, uh, fighting for them. It's really cool, man. Uh, well, I appreciate you stopping by. I know we kind of mentioned this off the top, but it takes some strength and it takes some courage to uh, get in front of a camera and talk about your struggles, you to, to talk about it to anyone in general, right? Even to a therapist or mm -hmm. whoever it is. And man, you've done it and you should be really proud of yourself. Um, the player you were, the person you are. Uh, I think this is very important for, for people to hear. And I hope we continue to do a lot of this mm -hmm. that, you know, some, some of the work that I'm trying to do, but, uh, it sounds like you are too. So, um, I want to thank you for driving down here, sitting down with me. Um, you're the man. Hey, that was awesome. Thank, thank you so much, me. man. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Unreal. And keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> thanks buddy. I appreciate it.